Okay, let's show a clip, Pia. Would you want to introduce your clip? Okay, um, I guess I should mention that there are fewer cuts in my clip than compared <laughs> to all the other clips. Um, Patty Considine um, directed Tyrannosaur. It was his first feature. He wrote and directed it. And he likes keeping things simple because the story and characters have to shine through. And it was such a a visceral and and just heartbreaking experience. I cried every day. Um, um, anyway, so the clip is Olivia's been beaten up by her husband and has asked Peter if he she could stay with him. And while she sleeps, he decides to take her keys and go deal with her husband. So that's what we'll see. So how do you deal with disasters at screenings? <laughs> <laughs> Just move on. Um, so Patty likes to keep things simple. Um, and besides editing, I, um, when he's walking through the house, I suggested the POV shot, not only to get me out of the editing, because um, I had a, a front shot of Peter and a rear shot, and I thought the POV would also add tension. So I was able to show Patty right away, and he agreed, and he picked it up. Um, then on the he goes home, and he looks at his house, and Patty hates establishing shots, but this shot of the house takes on a lot more meaning because Olivia's in there, and she contaminated his house, and um, the Christian Goody Two Shoes friend that he thought she was is completely has lied to him and um, kept this huge secret. So, um, and then there's, um, he confronts her, and I had two takes of Olivia. One, in one of them, she um, performed it aggressively, and in the other, she was acting as a victim. So it's a combination of intercutting these two takes. Um, and Patty felt, he likes to keep things fresh, so he doesn't do more than two or three takes. Um, so it's a matter of finding the right balance and um, and the best performance. So, so this clip was supposed to be longer. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. five minutes. I was given five minutes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it seemed abrupt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. Well, sorry to put you in that position. I know. How terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess. Uh, we should move on to the other clip. Well, yeah. we cross our fingers because yeah. yeah. <laughs> Axel stuff was do, cutting in and out as well earlier. So. Oh, was it? Was yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. When he was running yeah, video, right. it yes. was just the it was animation. getting intermittent. But anyway. All right, anyway, if we do get to see this, so this is, uh, this is more of a work in progress thing that um, we, my director Chum and I, had done um, Shrek and then we'd done Shrek 2, so we'd been in the animation world. He'd come from visual effects and he wanted to go back into live action, so we uh, moved from DreamWorks to Disney and started developing Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. And as part of that process, you know, they had a script writer on board and they were doing visual development stuff. And he managed to take some money from the visual development budget and get some storyboard artists going, so we produced a reel that became like a pitch reel as part of the process, and that was part of a package of stuff that got the film greenlit. So it's a kind of a presentation that was to sell his take on the adaptation of Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. So, so what I did here, and it's, I have to apologize if we actually get it to play, it's quite a crummy quick time, because quick times have come a long way. <laughs> but anyway, and it, the audio is slightly crummy to start with, but what it, what it does represent is um, some storyboard sequence that then transitions through to previous se se material that's very similar to the layout stuff we saw from Pixar earlier. And then it goes through to a sort of, I think it's a kind of rough cut of the early live action shots with visual effects plates. So it's just a little encapsulation of, um, of that process. Because what we actually then did, because of the, the fun we'd had doing the Shrek movies with the storyboard process, we actually once we got greenlit, we siphoned money out of the VFX budget and we storyboarded the entire movie. So we had storyboard for every scene that we were shooting, plus we previously action scenes. So as we were shooting, 
with all the millions of units and what stuff. We'd cut scenes and we'd drop them into context so we could see how the cut was progressing overall. Because one of the things with uh, VFX movies, as I'm sure you know, is that you have to start locking scenes way before your mm. cut's done. So you're still shooting and you have to be able to to feel committed enough to, to scenes that you can start working on the VFX. And in that, pr practically, um, which order practically every pair of legs was, was green pants that needed to be preferred and have you. So, so, so what we were able to do was have these scenes that we would, we would cut them a little long. I mean, you know, you have to, to, to give yourself that, but we'd be able to lock scenes in production because we had more, we were more confident because we could see them inside this sort of bed of storyboard and previous. So we were able to screen the movie as a, as a whole thing during the production process. Anyway, what this is, is the first two and a half minutes of that film. And, and it was uh, part of the reason we, we chose to previous that was because it's a section that's not in the book at all. The book, the children's book, Lion Witch Wardrobe, just starts with a very simple, um, it was war and the children went to live with, it, with their uncle. And what this was, was a sort of... Um, a dramatization of what war meant, war meant for the children and why they had to leave the city. So, cross fingers. Yes. If it makes a funny noise, shall we just stop? Probably. <laughs> yeah. okay. Depending on how funny. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> if it's a good funny noise. Yeah, yeah. Cross oh, fingers. Good luck. Right Thank you. Oh. Okay. So. <laughs> That was good. That was good. Yeah. Those are my monks. So I uh, picture it for you. So I got monks going, and then I got aeroplanes, bombers coming in, and ooh, you can be the monks. Yeah, I'll be the aeroplanes. Yeah. Funny enough, they're, they're, they're in tone. And so I don't on. think any of us were hired to actually yeah. mime out the thing. Well, yeah, animation. You end up doing a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll go back to a couple of questions and see if they can work out the. Uh, Sure. They're Problems. Yes. Bugs. They really do sound like bugs yeah. today. Bugs and monks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any ideas on how to mentor the editors of the future? Since uh, the apprentice position is almost gone and the assistant is usually so busy just keeping up that he can't spend much time with any of us. Uh. OK. Um, I've, when I started, I started on film. So we only had one work print. So you had to ask the, the editor if you could cut the scene. And you couldn't chop it up because you'd destroy the print. So um, it was a really great training ground for me. Um, as soon as the editor would leave the room, I'd jump on and cut a scene. And, and the method was so amazing, you had to plan ahead, the scene ahead. So I would mark it with a grease pencil, mark the script with overlaps and what sound was used, being used from what take. Um, anyway, it was a big, long process. Now that we have nonlinear, there's really no excuse. Like, I, if I were starting out now, I would cut anything and everything. I w if, I'm assist if I were assisting on a, on a film, I would just ask the editor if you could cut scenes in the background and I know the hours are long, but I worked very hard, and I was very passionate about the craft, so nothing was going to stop me from learning and, and cutting. Um, one thing I did on a film with um, assistants was I would give them a scene to cut, and I would ask the director if he, would, he or she would critique it with them. And although it was really intimidating for the assistants, they really learned how to deal with the, you know the comments and how to interpret notes um, so it was a li really great training ground um, yeah. Mm, I yeah I think technology certainly uh, you know one of the biggest things is the the democratization of uh, of the industry in the sense that in terms of the tools available when you know uh, an iPhone has editing abilities and I know this is a thing but I, I you know it, it never ceases to amaze me is that you sometimes you look on YouTube and you see what these kids you know effectively kids have put together and you just sort of think that you know that is remarkable that you know that they have this talent or you know 
maybe was they've always had the talent, but they've now had they've now got the tools. You know, um, I I I um, I came from more of a, a television background, um, so when when I was learning, I was learning sort of on sort of linear videotape based equipment, either one inch or umatic. Which in itself was an interesting discipline because because it wasn't nonlinear, mm -hmm. it, it really taught you to make decisions because it was a real pain in the neck to change things afterwards. So so that was great. That is something, obviously, that nonlinear has has gained some things, but you've lost you've lost a few things as well because you could try a lot of takes almost instantaneously. But I think in terms of the of the, the the technology. Um, you know, when people sort of say, how do, how do I get in and how do, how do I sort of start to learn editing? I mean, a lot of it is that you can actually just go and go and do it. And it's remarkable that actually, you know, these people that I'm sure, you know, with either very little or maybe, maybe even no training have started to make these basic things. And, in, and, and you start to see, you can actually look at the start to see the seeds of careers and, 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 and people, people <coughs> understanding how it works. Uh, of course, you know, for, and, and that, in fact, that's the thing that I think that's the thing as well that attracts sort of editors and, and sort of, um, you know, production managers as well um, uh, to sort of when, when people are applying for assistant positions these days, you could sort of say, well, look, I've, I've sort of done this, this and this. And a lot of it is maybe stuff you've just sort of done yourself. Um, but you look at it and you sort of go, well, you know, the, the CV list isn't huge. But the talent is there, and above all, the enthusiasm. And I think mm -hmm. that's the number one thing that will get you sort of anywhere is is that enthusiasm. And and I, uh, you know, even though it sounds like a cliche, I just I see, you see it proven time and time and time again um, that if you're really keen on, on 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 something, you know, you can make things, you can actually make things happen. Um, uh, and I would say that 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 is a very useful way nowadays for people to sort of start getting up the ladder they can do it themselves all those tools are at um, are at your disposal um, and still you know it's about knowing who you know having a lucky break on occasion getting in there but um, you know certainly you've in some respects um, you've got a much better start uh, 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 in, in some regards in terms of being able to just to practice to play with it and there's very little to get wrong there's no sort of wrong you know uh, you know, and as you as you as you learn, you know, you learn how how the the, the, the art of the craft work. But um, I think that's a great way nowadays to start. I think the hardest part for a lot of people who are assistants right now, the hardest element for them to get properly exposed to is when a a movie goes from being three hours long to ninety minutes long, and. It's something, it's, it's hard if they're not in the room or around those decisions and why they're being made. And that's by the nature of assisting now. It's, it's often based in another room. And, and quite often, just politically, it's not useful to have them in a, in a room while you're making tough decisions. And, uh, uh, and it's seeing how things are being protected and being kept afloat and kept alive. And I think it's all down to storytelling, really. I mean, if there's one thing... I've learned it's about actually you got to keep your head afloat in storytelling all the time in terms of like you know I stopped reading books a while ago and I've only started again recently and I've just realized how useful it is for for what I'm doing you know for, for, for editing I just find it just keeps your mind afloat with storytelling ideas being able to to lose things quickly and jump from one point to another and uh, and like I think that that is though I don't have the answer to how apart from going through the experience of cutting a feature from start to end, you know. But it's the hardest thing to, to, to get somebody to immerse them in, because as you say, they can jump into scenes and they can rework them and do all those things very quickly, but it's actually the, the harder yards of being so familiar with a story and then having to reimagine it, yeah. you know, is quite hard. Yeah. There's that, yeah. Well, yeah. I like to try, I get a lot of um, emails from people saying, how could I become an editor? And <clears throat> depending on how their emails are worded and whether I meet them first or whatever, at events like this indeed, um, I often will say, well, come by one day while the shoot is happening, spend the day in the cutting room, we can show you what a cutting room is like, whether you like the look of the whole process, and then if they show an aptitude, I'll give them a scene to cut. And... Um, 
they usually go away, you know, appreciative of that. But I can only do that on very limited, you know, limited amount of times yeah. on any shoot. Um, some years ago, I, I, I gave a scene for a gentleman who I know is in the audience today to cut. Um, and he showed an aptitude. He cut the scene. And I swear there are at least three edits from that scene still in the finished movie. <laughs> The last, the last film I did, uh, I started four weeks late for various reasons, and there had been an editor on it who had a knee replacement, so she never actually started, and they were reluctant to hire somebody else. They kept trying to think there would be some way she could come back onto the picture, but she didn't consider rehabilitation. So there was an, an assistant on the film, and I wondered, should I keep this assistant or take my regular assistant? And I thought I might as well give the guy a chance since he had given up something else to come on this and he seemed personable enough. So after a couple of weeks, he came over to me one afternoon. We were sitting in the room and he was looking at something I had cut. And he said, when you get a chance, I'd like, I've been doing some practicing. And I said, what is exactly, what is practicing? He said, well, I cut a scene. I said, well, which scene? He said, well, I'm waiting in the hospital scene. I said, okay, I'd love to see it. And before leaving that evening, I did, I took a look at it. He had done a wonderful job. And without him, I gave him several more scenes to cut after that, though we discussed them beforehand. Uh, I was absolutely thrilled that he had taken this initiative to go and do it. And he probably cut about 10 scenes that ended up substantially in the movie. And I was able to make the, the deadline to, to show the film to the director right after they finished shooting. Without him, I would have been late. So that was a good thing.